And just going by uh, a previous special the end, years ago, uh, showing Marx and other characters of the, as if they were alive today. And Marx was explaining something to Marie Antoinette. And at one point he said that he uh, actually was impressed by capitalism. Something in fact he was impressed by capitalism. He thought it was good in this time. His time was coming to an end. But it showed what man, humanity, was capable of. Did Absolutely. you actually say something to that effect? Oh, yeah. I, th th you, I, I didn't mention this. Um, but not only, you know, I've sort of been pointing to in this thing the sort of almost libertarian aspects of some of Marx's ideas, but not only that, he had some very positive things to say about capitalism. And if you think about it, from his perspective, capitalism was not only the most productive economic system that had ever existed, it was actually also the most just system. Uh, the, 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 the most fair system, I mean, if you compare it to feudalism and slave states and all these things that came before it. So his problem, again, was not a moral problem. His, his point was that it won't last forever. Uh, nothing lasts forever, and capitalism is no exception. There are uh, mechanisms built right into capitalism that it's uh, the, you know, the, the thing that's going to destroy capitalism is not necessarily people holding up signs and marching in the street or even people fighting with guns. The thing that's going to destroy capitalism is capitalism. That capitalism itself contained the seeds of its own destruction. And uh, again, this was not a, a moral problem, and he actually had a lot of praise for what capitalism had accomplished, and a, and a lot of praise for the bourgeois class, uh, believe it or not. Uh, yes? What does Bobovell have to do with it? Oh, I never talked about that. <laughs> uh, yeah, so like I said at the beginning of this, uh, we have had at least 100 years, but really more than that, of these two sides, uh, two systems of propaganda that have been fighting against each other, and I feel like more and more sort of missing the point as they get lost and lost in this argument against each other, they're slowly flying away further and further from reality. Um, and uh, I, I was thinking about that, and I, I happened to be reading um, something about Neil Cassidy, the uh, beat poet, uh, and this is something that Jack Kerouac said, re related a story about him, that um, they would be going out and hanging out in bars, and inevitably there would be uh, people getting in fights, as happens at bars. People get drunk and they, somebody bumps into someone else, or someone says something that someone else misinterprets, and eventually there's some kind of conflict that builds up. And it's often a conflict over nothing, or a conflict that maybe uh, disguises or confuses the real conflict that's going on. And when a situation like that arose, Neil Cassidy had a, uh, a thing that he would do, which was he, he would jump in between the two people who were about to start fighting at the bar, and he would say, you want some gum? You want some gum? Do you want gum? Do you want gum? And he, they would get so distracted and so confused <laughs> by this offer of gum. Like, why are you talking about gum now? We're in the middle of this, this battle. Um, and, and that would often diffuse the situation, and it would cause the people to sort of rethink what they were uh, arguing about. And that's kind of what I would like. I would like... I don't necessarily want people to stop arguing, but I want them to have a, a new argument about Karl Marx. <laughs> And uh, I don't know whether bubblegum for, you know, Ted asked, is, is for the correct preposition? Is it bubblegum for? I don't know if it is bubblegum for, maybe it's a bubblegum at Karl Marx. No, no, no. But uh, one way or another, bubblegum's got to get involved. That's my, that's my. Did you hear your topic, the two sides you talked about are pro-communism and anti-communism? Yeah. Okay. Yep. Okay. That's what I was thinking. Anybody else have some questions? Yes. Uh, you, um, when you brought up that slide about um, the uh, about communists and guns, basically about and communists what? about guns. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, a phrase that stuck out to me was that the revival of old old 
old-style citizens' militia must be opposed. Yeah, um, it's interesting. What do you mean by that? It, 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 apparently there were these, this was kind of the, um, uh, have you ever heard of the Fry Corps? That was something that existed in the 20th century. So there was like, uh, this was like the very beginnings of what became the Fry Corps, which was, the Fry Corps were really bad people. Uh, and they became really important in the 1920s. Um, and in fact, they sort of led to the rise of Hitler and the Nazi party. And before that, they were like doing all of these uh, sort of politically motivated assassinations. They assassinated uh, um, Rosa Luxemburg and Karl Liebknecht, Liebknecht, who was actually the son of um, Wilhelm Liebknecht, who I mentioned during, during the talk. Um, and uh, in a way, I feel like that was the end of real Marxism before everything went into this like weird other thing. Um, but anyway, the Freikorps was like really bad people. And um, uh, I, I maybe sort of implied in your question was, are people like that comparable to some of the sort of like right wing militia types that are here in the United States? Maybe, I don't know, that, that might be a stretch, but there, there might, I mean, I think that Marx was concerned that there were these um, anti-worker armed groups that were uh, uh, there to suppress the people, and he thought that in turn the workers needed to defend themselves against groups like that with their own, as he puts it, uh, workers' councils. Uh, running their own um, armed groups. I guess you wouldn't call them militias, but you could call them something else. We'll call them workers' councils. I don't know. That, but that's what he's referring to. Um, and it was, a, it was a big problem at the time. Yeah, I just wanted to add that uh, I did recently find out on Facebook a, a, a month ago that, that there's now these, like, uh, um, you know, these, these polka groups that are uh, more like the communists as opposed to like the NRA. Oh really? Yeah. I just found out about them recently. Well uh, that the United States story. I think that's good, especially because NRA to me, the NRA isn't even really a, a, a gun organization. To me it's primarily a white supremacist organization. I mean I think the fact that uh Philando Castile Castile? Castile. Castile. Yeah. This is Ryan Point has been pretty much what they're like the NRA. That they <laughs> that they didn't do anything in his case shows that, uh, to me, it shows a, a racial bias in their, in their organization. Oh, yeah, of and uh, so I think if, if people are you know, interested in, in um, uh, protecting the Second Amendment, they should turn elsewhere than the NRA. I don't think that's those are the best, uh, the best uh, allies to have. Mm. Yeah. Go ahead, Ted. Um, I thought it was a fascinating talk. I, I feel like you didn't get into the high theory of it. No, I sure you, didn't. You, I, you, I, you I really, went right around Yeah, there. you really like, tried to get away from that, which yeah. I loved. And I feel like you really humanized it in some ways. Like, I never thought about the dispute between Bakunin and him as being more of a personal vendetta because of just outright human prejudice. Yeah. Rather than like some grand ideological positioning. I, I think mean, it that was wasn't a part of it, but I think it was both. And yeah. I there's a there's a great book that I that you gave me. No. Yes. <laughs> called The First Socialist Schism. <laughs> and you. that was such a great book. And it, it talks about that conflict in depth. And it's fascinating. And there there's there's bad aspects to both sides of that conflict, to be honest. Um, and, uh, I, like, Bakunin, at a certain point, really did start engaging in some sort of anti-Semitic uh, sort of conspiracy theory um, stuff. And also being a bit disingenuous, like uh, claiming that, oh no, we're, we're not organized, we're just a, a bunch of people who happen to feel similarly about things, but in fact they were actually like 
very tightly organized, and he was like handing out special badges that if you were a member of the higher ranking member. Of, and in fact, one thing that's really interesting about that conflict is that, and this doesn't apply to Engels, but Marx, if you read some of the criticisms that Marx himself has for Bakunin, it's kind of a surprise because he sort of considered Bakunin to be too much of an authoritarian. He thought that Bakunin was trying to take over uh, the International Working Men's Association and uh, was sort of using subterfuge to uh, form some kind of elite group that was gonna, uh, gonna take over. And um, in a weird way, although I don't think he was totally consistent about it, in a way you can sometimes look at Marx as being more of an anarchist than the anarchists, more of a liberal than the liberals, more of a nihilist than the nihilists. The nihilists were around at the same time. Um, and they, you know, they, we call them nihilists, they call themselves nihilists, but when you look at the stuff they actually believed, they believed stuff. They, they didn't believe in nothing. They, some of them were even religious, but, but they, had, they had very deep uh, uh, convictions and uh, sort of idealistic uh, things they believed in. Marx was much more, again, the ruthless criticism of all that exists. He was kind of like, uh, you know, attacking everyone. Um, but yeah, it, I think that that conflict, that conflict went through a few stages. So like, at the beginning, it started as some kind of conflict about people who were on the board of a library in Switzerland, and it just like spiraled out of control. There was like a guy, um, oh, I'm blanking on his name right now, who was a total jerk. <laughs> Uh, who really started the whole conflict and then switched sides partway through. <laughs> and, um, oh, I'm blanking on his name. Um, and, uh, but then, yeah, there, there, there were some serious um, political and ideological questions being debated. The big issue, really, was that Marx and Engels Again, somewhat ironically, given that in the 50s, the 1850s, uh, they were like, we don't want to have any part of any political party. Political parties are stupid. Um, now, uh, in the late 1860s, early 1870s, they were saying the International Workingmen's Association has to turn itself into a group of political parties that are going to run people for office in the various parliaments that were starting up around uh, Europe, which is, I mean, it's, I feel like it's ironic on many different levels. Um, for, for one thing that like, you know, uh, the next century, a lot of uh, Marxists would say, don't take part in, in democracy because you'll just be completely corrupted. Um, uh, you'll become a liberal uh, reformist uh, opportunist. Um, at that point, Marx and Engels were saying, yeah, take part in, in democracy, take part in parliament. Even if you lose, it'll actually be better uh, for our party if we learn to organize, our, organize ourselves into political parties. And people like Bakunin and Guillaume were saying, no, we don't want to. Uh, we're, that's, not, that's not our focus. That's, so, and things, like I say, if you look like the history between the first international and the second international, things almost flip-flopped in that uh, way, where they still were divided along more or less the same lines, but the opposite way that they had been. Um, but it, it, it gradually de uh, degenerated into sort of nationalistic, um, you know, people were, people on what, the, it was sort of the, the Russians and Eastern Europeans and also the Spanish and part of the Swiss, the Francophone Swiss, the French-speaking Swiss people on one side and then the Germans and the English uh, on the other side and then the French were a special case because a lot of those people were followers of Blanqui, who was his own sort of complicated figure, who by the way, you know, 
Marx criticized almost all of the other socialists around in his time as being uh, utopian socialists. He did that to some extent, and then Engels did it even more. Um, meanwhile, Blanqui was saying, Marx and Engels, those guys are utopian socialists. Um, and he has sort of an interesting point. Blanqui is a weird guy. He was, he was, and like the, the original Communist League, a lot of those people were followers of Blanqui, and they believed, <laughs> they believed that um, you should keep your organization totally secret. It should be this tiny elite group of secret conspirators, basically. And Marx is like, no, let's publicize ourselves. You know, this is why he writes the manifesto. And I think that's to his credit. He didn't want secret societies. He wanted everything to be open. But people got mad at him later because of the Cologne communist trial. They thought that he had exposed uh, the communists and then run away. And then all of his buddies had to go on trial and get thrown in prison. Um, but he had that journalistic streak. Yeah. But... Uh, um, but yeah, the, it, it, unfortunately it degenerated into this sort of nationalistic and then, um, like I said, anti-Semitic conflict. So there's, there's bad behavior on bo both sides of that conflict for sure. Uh, maybe one more question? All right, one more question. Yes, sir. Yes, you. <laughs> <laughs> you win! You, you kind of touched upon what I was going to ask. Um, this you know, the relentless criticism on the one hand. But how does he himself distinguish himself from being utopian? Because it sounds like that's what he's trying to do. He's just like saying, well, the service run capitalism is going to eventually fail. But is there anything that can really, other than utopia, that can uh, really satisfy him? You know, I heard somebody on a, a podcast recently who said, <laughs> he wrote, I, can't, um, I, I don't remember his name or the name of his book, but he wrote an alternate history of the 20th century, um, starting from um, if not only the Russian Revolution had been successful, but also, you know, at the same time, there was the German Revolution where the Kaiser was deposed and they started to try to make some kind of socialist republic in Germany. And if that had succeeded and then socialism had spread throughout Europe, what would happen then? So he wrote this sort of alternate history, and it's like, here we are in the 21st century, and it's got this whole back history that's totally different. And um, he was being interviewed about the book on this podcast, and uh, they said, isn't what you're writing utopian? And he said, yes, <coughs> this is utopian. I don't think that scientific socialism is possible. All we have is utopian socialism, um, which was a, quite a statement. Um, I don't know the answer to your question, and I, sometimes in my more pessimistic moments, <laughs> I feel that my biggest disagreement with Marxism is that, is not so much, like, let's take, for the sake of argument, let's just assume that everything that Marx says in Capital is true, and that capitalism is doomed to collapse and fail which I actually do think is true. I don't think it's going to collapse exactly the way that he thought it was going to collapse, but I think there are real problems in capitalism that are not easy to solve and may indeed lead to its collapse. But in my more pessimistic moments, I think, yeah, but then what happens? Uh, and it, you know, it's possible that the next economic system, whatever it is, it's not, there's no guarantee that it'll be better. It might be just as bad, it might be worse. And I don't think that Marx ever gave a um, substantial, uh, not only did he get, not give a justification that what's coming will be better, he didn't even really say what's coming. And, 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 and that was not a, uh, an oversight on his part. He intentionally refused. Uh, at, at one point he says, uh, I refuse to write the cookbooks of, the, of tomorrow, how does it go? I, I refuse to write, write the cookbooks for tomorrow's cooks, or something like that. I'm not getting the words of the right. Which is actually kind of a silly thing to say, because cookbooks, you can read cookbooks from 
hundreds of years ago and they still make good food. I don't know. <laughs> but uh, but he, he is intentionally refusing to say what a future society would look like. He thought that the workers themselves should determine what the society would be like. Which is a nice thing to say, but it's also kind of a cop-out. Um, you know, sometimes... It doesn't help us in the here and now. Yeah, I mean, um, sometimes the, the, the best way to get a Marxist to shut up is to ask them what they want. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, because they won't tell you exactly how society should be organized. And that's a problem. And I think that there doesn't need to be a person who's going to be some kind of oracle who's going to tell us how it will be. But there could be a lot of people suggesting a lot of different things and then and talking about them openly. And we can all discuss this this idea that there should be a prohibition on there, you should never write any kind of blueprint for a future society, I think is actually self-destructive because everything is changing so fast. We're going to suddenly find ourselves in the future and we won't know what to do. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, thanks a lot, Ian. Thank